Thanks again, everybody. Thanks for coming back in. We will now begin the exciting portion of the afternoon. Actually, I think it's already been fairly exciting, but uh, uh, this is another thing that... Um, I'm, there's a theme in this room. It's all stuff I didn't know three months ago, like all of it. Um, I thought I was pretty smart, but I was wrong, apparently. So uh, this is a talk about unikernels. It turns out that a unikernel is a very interesting thing with a lot of cool uses that I had no idea about. Um, our distinguished guest, Uli, is going to start talking about them, and then our, our intern, Ali Raza, who's been working with us all summer and is working on a PhD in this subject, will continue from there. Thanks, Uli. All right. So I, I want to keep it short. So Ali is the one who is doing the work, and he deserves to speak for that. So I just want to say that unicorns have been, and Orrin uh, will... Uh, expand on this if necessary. You have been of interest in academia for a while. So when we are talking about something in this area, which then also is useful for Red Hat specifically or the industry in general, well, we don't like to start out from scratch and do something else and expand our code base, which we have to maintain and support tremendously. So when we discussed this a couple of months ago, so we came to the conclusion, well, let's try to do something else. Let's try to do something where we are not expanding our code base that much, where we are trying to use exactly what we are already doing as Red Hat, so Linux kernel, Linux uh, user land environment, and try to do something which is, uh, provides the benefits of a unikernel, which Ali will explain in a bit for those who are not aware of this, but at the same time make something which we can actually support. And that's going to be the, so, and the, what Ali will present is, yes, this is actually possible. And for us, this means that perhaps we will actually be able to base products on that and we will do, uh, be able to do more research in exactly that uh, area going forward. So uh, I might speak a couple more words in the end, but for now, let's talk. Let's Ali talk. Hi. So, yes, so... I don't have a display over here, so I'll have to just point there. Anyways, so hi everybody, I'm Ali, and I'll be talking about the project that, that I did over the summer, uh, Unikernels based on Linux. My advisors for the project are Uli and Richard Jones from Red Hat, and my PhD advisor, Professor Oran Krieger from BU, and also from Boston University, my fellow PhD students. Uh, Jim and Tommy, who've been also involved in this project and have been helping with this project. So, first questions first. What is a unikernel? So, this is what a normal kernel looks like. There's a separation between the kernel space and a user space. The kernel contains whatever the applications might need, file systems, device drivers, the core OS functionality, for example, scheduler or uh, memory management, things like that. And multiple applications run on top of that. But in a unikernel, there's just one application which includes only the required functionality in it as a, as a library. Whatever is there is com contained in this one binary which then runs on top of uh, the hardware. This is what a unikernel is. Now the next big question, why unikernels? And the answer is really simple, because they're great. So why are they great? First of all, they're lightweight. because uh, the unikernel only contains the required functionality, the bare minimum required functionality that, that an application needs and nothing else. Uh, which means that, uh, for example, let's just say if there's an application which does not need the file system support, the kernel will, the unikernel will not have the file system support in it. Which means smaller attack surface because there's a lot less code to exploit. Also, the unikernel when booting up will only initialize devices and other things that the application needs. So that results in faster boot times. Unikernels also give us improved performance because since there's no separation between a user space and a kernel space, there we do not, do not incur the ring transition overheads. And with the unikernel, we can do application-specific optimizations. For example, in a unikernel, you can have very efficient, extremely stripped-down network stack because there's only one application that uses it. And there are many uh, unikernels out there. For example, Abarty, ClickOS, Mirage OS, and many others. 
And as I already said, they give us huge performance benefits. For example, FRT gives us more than two times uh, memcache D throughput as compared to something running on simple Linux. Uh, Ling's own website, which runs on Ling Unikernel, takes only 25 MB of memory. And uh, network processing uh, software made on uh, Click OS, the Unikernel, it processes more than 5 million packets per second, and its uh, boot up time is under 30 milliseconds. So, as, as we see, Unikernels are great, but they're, they've mostly been limited to uh, academic and research circles. They're not as widely used. Uh, one of the reasons is that they are not general purpose, which means that you cannot just take any application and uh, compile it into a unikernel without modification. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at why that is the case and what can we do for it. So starting off with the development model of unikernels. Uh, this is one of the main reasons that unikernels are not ad as widely used. There are two approaches to basically build a unikernel that have been taken by developers who have developed different uh, unikernels. First is the clean slate approach where you start fresh, write the entire unikernel yourself, build it from the ground up. And the second is that you, excuse me, second is that you fork an existing code base, for example Linux or NetBSD, change it, modify it, uh, do all the optimizations, you, optimizations that you want, strip it down and make, make a unikernel out of it. As we discussed, this is a great approach. Uh, this has uh, nice advantages to it. For example, the developers have total control over the code. They can do different optimizations that they want to do, and this results in great performance benefits. But it also has its drawbacks. For example, you cannot just run any legacy application on these unikernels without modification. Since there's no community around these uh, projects, for example, as compared to Linux or glibc, where there's an entire huge community which keeps maintaining these projects, these unikernel projects, they don't have that community around them, so they're a maintaining and testing nightmare. So what can the future be? What questions can we ask? The main question that we ask is, how can we change the development model? Can this unikernel be part of the Linux code base, the Linux project, or, and the glibc project? In this, in this development model, the main thing would be that you just need a unikernel that works. It does not, it might not be the best unikernel or the most optimized unikernel out there, it just has to work. And as over the years, as Linux has undergone incremental improvements, this unikernel, when it will be part of Linux code base or the glibc code base, it will also undergo incremental optimizations. And also, since this is a huge community, they will keep maintaining this unikernel as part of the Linux and the glibc code base. What are the advantages for it? First of all, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can just simply use the entire Linux code base, which means that we have unchanged API for uh, developers and for legacy applications. And we can support all the different uh, device drivers file systems, which results in a unikernel which can run in virtual machine as well as on bare metal. That's an important thing. So imagine with all this, if, if this were true, if we could do this, imagine a unikernel with GPU support. How cool would that be? Right? So now the big question, the big elephant in the room, is it even possible? So yes, over the summer we built such an uh, unikernel which is, based, which is based on Linux. What I'm going to show you is that unikernel booting up. We uh, have a simple uh, TCP server running on it. So as soon as I can figure it out. So you'll see the kernel booting up and then you'll see the server come up. So if you can all see, this is, this is what we've done over the summer, a unikernel on Linux which runs a simple server and it works. Now what we'll discuss is what were the goals for this project and how did we actually do it? Goals, these are based on pretty much what I've discussed before. We want upstream acceptance. We want something which we, which we want to make as little changes to the Linux code base and the glibc code as possible so they, they, we have a higher chance of this getting accepted upstream. We want an unchanged Linux API we want uh, this unikernel to be deployed on, to be able to be deployed on uh, virtual machines and bare metal. And we want unikernels which are application specific. Now talking about the architecture. This is a normal Linux architecture. Now how a normal Linux looks like. There's 
kernel space, user space, there's the application, user libraries, then the C library. Normally what happens is that the application makes function calls in the C library and function calls into the user library. The user library then makes function calls into the C library. And normally, it is the C library which then makes uh, system calls into the Linux kernel. Now, since this is a unikernel, we don't want this uh, system call functionality. What we have in its place is a very small UKL library. And what that does is, simply, C library makes function calls, not system calls. Function calls into the, C li into the UKL library, which then calls appropriate code in the kernel. And all of this together is our Linux uh, based unikernel. And when we compile it, this all becomes one big binary. There's no separation between different libraries, different address spaces. This is just one thing which runs on hardware. Now, this is what we've done currently. This is, what we, this is where we are now. But in the future, what we want is, we don't want this UK library to be there. We want some of its functionality to be part of the C library and some of its functionality to be part of the Linux kernel. And this is what we want our final Linux-based unikernel to look like. So here are some of the implementation details. So this might look like that in order to build this unikernel based on Linux, we had to do so many different changes to the Linux code base, to the glibc, but that is not the case. Here we have the main.c uh, file from the Linux, uh, Linux tree. In it, just before the user space is started, we add our own function, the kmain, which comes from the application. So just before the user space is started, we call our own function. This kmain, now this is uh, some application code. This kmain, as you can see, is provided by the application. Uh, continuing with the example of the TCP server that we discussed earlier that I showed you booting up, this is simple TCP server code. As you can see, the headers are same as what any application headers might look like. The main thing is the initializations uh, code. Now, normally the initializations are done by system D, but in our case, we have to do them ourselves. In a initialization code will run before the application code will run, and it will do the application specific uh, initializations. In our case, uh, we are bringing up the network interface in this uh, TCP server example. So that code goes in initialization. After that, the rest of the code remains same. And, and uh, an interesting thing you look at the bottom is that this function does not return. Because this is just one process in the kernel right now. If this returns, uh, then the kernel will be rendered unusable. So this function does not return. Now coming on to how we uh, compile and build this and run this. As compared to how you will compile and build a normal application, what we're doing with, uh, in, in our case is, we're compiling the application code. We're also compiling the UKL library. And we're packaging both of them together into a UKL.a and archive. After that, after making an archive, what we're doing is we're borrowing a lot of functionality from the Linux kernel build process. So while we're making the kernel, in the linking phase, we add our UKL.a, our archive, so it gets linked at link time, and that becomes one uh, binary which can then be deployed. Uh, right now, we're testing it on uh, QMU. So the, the video that I showed you was this same, this in this unikernel running on QMU. In the future, what we want is, we just want to call make on a user application. We just want to say, okay, use this compiler, UKL GCC compiler, and that's it. You run make on your application and it should give you a unikernel which can then be deployed on bare metal on virtual machine or on some emulator like QMU. So there were a lot of positive outcomes over the summer, the things that we can build on. For example, we just added one line to the Linux code base. The glibc code, the redirection code, which instead of making the system calls in the kernel, which does function calls into the UK library, that is in a separate subtree. API remained unchanged, and because of all this, most of the user libraries will not have to be recompiled for unikernel, for our unikernel. The ones which do make direct system calls, we just need to change uh, the name of the function, and they can also be used with our unikernel. So, we uh, believe that with these modest changes, our chances of getting accepted upstream eventually are very high. So what are the next steps? There's lots to do. First of all, as I said, 
we need to take care of, take care of the initializations that are normally done by system D. So whenever an application code runs, before that we have application specific initializations that run. Also, we need config options so that user, based on their application, can tell, okay, this is these are the things that I need. These are, turn on these this functionality and not this. Turn off this based on what the application needs and does not need. So that our uh, unikernel is extremely application specific, trimmed down. We want uh, support for pthreads and C++. Also, we need to clean up everything. As I showed you earlier, right now we are borrowing a lot from the Linux build process. We want to clean this up in, it's in a nice and uh, pretty way that this can be finally accepted upstream. Also, we want finally op automatic optimization so that instead of users telling us that this is what uh, the application needs, we can just look at the code and only include uh, those things that are needed by that application. So this, uh, I think I have my work cut out for my PhD. <laughs> So, based on what we've done and what we plan to do, there are a lot of uh, interesting research questions and interesting questions that we can ask. For example, what are the performance and start time uh, benefits that we can get? For example, if we don't do any optimizations at all, just run it as it is, what is the benefit, the performance and start time benefit that we can get uh, as compared to simple Linux kernels? If we only do link time optimizations, what are the benefits that we get then? And also, after that, uh, building on what a lot of other research unikernels have done, for example, uh, customized code paths and uh, preemptible threads, sorry, non-preemptible threads, things like that, how can we get those optimizations into our unikernel and then see what are the, uh, the benefits that we can get? Also, once we add all those, uh, keep adding all those optimizations to our uh, to our unique kernel, can we still keep the changes to a minimum so that this can still be acceptable upstream? And also, this unique kernel model, how can we, uh, you know, get benefit of its security uh, guarantees that it can give us? And we want to look at the performance and security benefits with all the different use cases that uh, are in use today. For example, normal cloud workloads, memcached, how can we improve the performance of memcached and give better security uh, guarantees? How can uh, faster boot times help functions as a service? Uh, can we explore these benefits in other use cases, for example, HPC and embedded systems? And also, for example, the Ceph storage, if there's an application which is extremely I.O. intensive, what can we do to optimize that in our use case here? So yes, as I said, uh, based on what we did and what we are going to do, there's a, there are a lot of interesting questions that are out there and uh, we'll be looking at them. And now uh, I'll ask Uli to uh, give his comments and his input and where this project is going. Okay. Uh should be back on yet. Okay. Uh, so hopefully you're a little bit more excited about the topic than before. If you didn't know anything about it before, now you should be a little bit more excited. So the main benefit is that we don't have to change much code. So that is, makes it, pre this is a prerequisite for Red Red actually using this uh, in some future. So if we actually get to the point that we can do this, we have to just recompile the kernel and uh, some of the low-level libraries with a special option and we get it to be usable in, in, uh, as a unikernel. So the, you saw a couple of slides back there which we call in the moment UKLGC, so however we are going to call this in the future is, is, remains to be seen, but the goal is really that the build process, the only thing which a programmer has to change is to change, use a different compiler. So we will have to get from the kernel build process the, all the code which makes up the kernel normally as an archive, that's the part. We can get the startup code, some of it perhaps to be dynamically generated when the program comes up based on the configuration of the program the user is providing, and then the user code see, by itself, plus perhaps some third-party archives of some sort. And as Ali mentioned, we don't even have to recompile them in many cases. If these archives are not doing any system calls, the ABI hasn't changed and we can just reuse them. So all of this gets linked together. We have something which can boot then regardless of what it is and what it is running. So parts of the work which you have to do as well is make this more generic. So we might have to add initialization things like DHCP server cli uh, clients, et cetera, these kind of things. But we know about this and we're, we're on the track to do that. 
So what you see here on the slides, for instance, is something which is a little bit alien to me. So this is not my world. So things like function as a service. So I talked with Oren about this, and he said, ah, yeah, no problem. We can port a JVM on top of the Unicorn in a couple of days because he has done that in the past. So, so I'm looking forward to that. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> So Node.js and Python on that is very much. So for those, anyone here know uh, MicroPython? So MicroPython is a uh, Python implementation for microcontrollers. So I wanted to have this basically a normal Python in the Unicorn, which is the equivalent of that for my larger machines which just can do that. And as Ali said, this has implications not only for performance, it also means that some of the attacks which might exist out there will have no effect because all of a sudden these programs are looking completely different. So, but the function as a service is the main thing, so back to that kind of thing. Um, for function as a service, the main uh, uh, draw is that you don't waste ru uh, running the code if, if there's no user around. So you only spin up the code when it is necessary. And for this to be useful, the hysteresis of the, um, of, of the control system, which decides when to shut down the process and when to start it up again, has to be as narrow as possible to be as efficient as possible. And the faster the startup time is of the process, the narrower you can make it, the more energy you can save, the less resources you're using. Normal call boots up. If you tune it, you can then get it down to, let's say, 30 seconds. This thing, we can perhaps boot up in a millisecond. So it's much more efficient than that. We can just kill it and bring it up back up again and have the same function running again. So I think this, this uh, and the other part which I want to mention as well, so in my life, in my career here, I'm mostly interested not in, in Java services and these kind of things. I'm mostly interested in high performance, low latency computing, et cetera, among them also machine learning now, which is just high performance computing. And what has been bothering the HPC community at the very least uh, for a long time is that they don't have control over the machine as much as they want. So they are doing things like core isolation now and moving interrupts to specific cores and all these kind of things. Imagine if they are combining the application now as a unicorn and have 100% control over how the different cores, et cetera, are used. Vince? But even in, even in that use case, you're still saying that this would have to be invocable through something like QMU or otherwise. Could be. But uh, so even in the HPC cluster and functions as a service, the thing would be running likely as non-root. Like. Yeah, function as a service, yes. You would run this in a, in a container, virtual machine bring this up there. So this can boot on naked hardware. It can boot on a virtual machine. You don't need QMO under this. QMO is just for the development. This is, this is just like a normal Linux kernel which you boot up. Instead, it doesn't spawn a PID1. It does the work internally. That's the only difference. So this is also what Ali showed there in the slide. So initd, the execv, is the one which spawns init. PID1. We took this out, we run the code directly. So this is actual code which can boot on by metal or virtual machines. So can I jump in for a sec? So two points. First of all, I never said two days. Um, <laughs> but a couple, one thing I just want to emphasize here that's been said but just is really important to me is that you know there's all this work going on now because um, we're, we're dealing with really high-speed devices and SSDs and, and um, networks that are going up to 100 gigabits and people are moving, using DPDK and SPDK and doing things in user level and bypassing the operating system. And, um, you know, this approach gives you a totally different alternative way of addressing these problems. You know, hugely less complexity to recompile your program in this way, have a part of the kernel, and then we can start seeing incrementally how to get rid of copies and things like that. So I think it's going to be a much, much more efficient way. And the second thing is that because the application and the kernel are bundled together, it's an encapsulated object. So you can snapshot this thing, you can move this data around, you can replicate and so it becomes a manageable object in a much easier way than what we have today. And that's what these guys are actually looking at with function and service. One question we are on like security. In this way, when you go to compile it, do you only pull in the pieces of the Linux kernel that you care about? So like for example, file system drivers, blah, 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 et cetera. Yeah. 
So that's the that's the goal. So for the time being, so Ali mentioned that we are going to work this based on config options. But later on, so there, there's a mention of link time optimization. So in this path in the compiler, we actually know a lot about global information about the code we have because we see all the code. So if everything is compiled with LTO enabled, we actually not only have the source code, the binary code, and so on, we have all the meta information still available there. We can run information discovery based on that. We can find out, oh yeah, there's never going to be a file system access, so we compile this out. There's never going to be uh, SCCP, uh, SCCP uh, protocol. We compile that out. We never have TCP, compile that out. So imagine how small the attack surface all of a sudden becomes. So you said that there is going to be little changes needed for the user space or the kernel program, um, but just curious if there's any sort of um, programming constructs that would be encouraged, such as avoiding floating point or mutexes and semaphores and the like? Yeah, so uh, jump in if you want. So no, the, the thing is that um, the only thing which you cannot do is call a fork. So this is the one process environment. And everything else should work. So we have our work cut out. So part of the slides was that we have to enable uh, TLS, we have to enable C++ initialization, all these kind of things, constructors. This remains work to be done. But we are expecting that we actually can have the, the ABI and API being 100% compatible to that, what it is. And the, uh, the uh, mutex and so the synchronization parts and so on. So multiple threads we will support, of course, we have to support. And the synchronization is using mutexes. And the kernel internally is already using mutexes. There is nothing in there. The only thing is that instead of having a system call, we are actually using function calls in, internally. Yes, I mean, okay. I just had a quick question. You said, talked about running Java, and I see all kinds of alligators, right? If you have dynamic class loading, then all of a sudden you weren't using a particular TCP, and now you are. So you yeah. can't know ahead of time no, about no. anything. So we do, you, that's one of the limitations which you have there. So we need to have not a JVM binary. You need to have the archive which makes it up, and everything is statically linked. Dynamic linking will not, will not, well, at least not initially support it. See, theoretically, we could do these kind of things, but then we would rely on uh, not the whole program and anal analysis to actually decide what to leave out or not. Then it will be con uh, user configurable. And the other one um, was you said you're limited to one thread, right? No, what no, one process. One process. So I can start up several GC threads and, yeah. and other things. Okay. Big difference, POSIX po uh, post threat, POSIX process. By the way, just Libra, there's a thing called Libra, which is for the genome. So in, in other words, so Orin already did this work in the past, and this is why I claimed he said today's work. Have there been any upstream comments yet? Or? No, we haven't passed this on to upstream right now. So, but uh, the, as uh, Ali described it, so far the only real change in the kernel is a single line of code, which we have to do there. There will be a little bit more. It's unquestionably there. But we can isolate these kind of things. We will have discussions with the folks. So the C library part is even less controversial. So after fixing a couple of bugs in there, only thing which I had to do is add some subtree to the source code, and it is not touched by any other configuration, so I see no objections. Um, do you have a gate link or a GitHub link to that? Pardon? Uh, do you have a gate or a GitHub link to that? Um, not yet, so we'll, it's, it's all private in the moment, but we are going to have this at some point soon. Yeah. And also we want, to clean up, we want to clean up a lot of the build process before we go upstream. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> this first started working. <laughs> <laughs> not mainly, but just like a couple of days ago. <laughs> yeah, so uh, he, I really got it to the server to work a couple of days ago, so uh, there were a couple of challenges and he had many papers to write, blame his professors. <laughs> um, from a security perspective, uh, so if the application and the kernel are separate, when the application is compromised, then the attacker also has to find the fault in the kernel to also have control of the whole system. But when you combine them all into the same memory space, then when the application is compromised, the whole system is now compromised, yes. right? So is that... No, like no, so, but the problem with compromising a kernel is only that then you can use it to leverage compromising the other applications running on it. But if there are no other applications, what do you gain? 